if you notice on the screen, we're beginning where we left off last week. Now, we're re- actually ready for verse 9. Uh, the problem with that is verse 9 puts us in the middle of a context that it, without verses 7 and 8, we really can't understand. We talked about this last week a little bit, about how when you read a narrative and in a Bible class study like this, and you have to read um, in sections, you know, you have to you have to start and then stop and go back a week and all that stuff. So we want to we want to press play, but not without remembering where we've been. But we can't just stop right in the middle and know exactly what's going on. So Cliff Notes version from chapter one up until now. The queen, Queen Vashti, has been stripped of her role, okay? She has the title of queen taken from her. She's still part of the harem. She's still considered royalty. But because she disobeyed the command of the king, or ignored the command of the king, let's say, uh, she, the, the king became angry. His, uh, his advisors advised him, you know, well, there's going to be an uprising if you don't do something. And so he takes that title away from her. That causes a national beauty contest. And so here you have all these beautiful women, Josephus says 400 of them, coming in to be tested. You know, they go through their beautification treatments and learn how to operate in the Persian court. That takes a year. So by the time we get to Esther being appointed queen, uh, two years, or give or take, have passed uh, between, well, I should say four years, have passed between Vashti's uh, being removed from her role and in place king because during that time King Ahasuerus or as we may know him better Xerxes the first is on a uh, he's on a military excursion he's trying to do something that his father never could do and that is to conquer Greece and uh, Xerxes was not able to conquer Greece he lost that battle very miserably And uh, thanks to historians like Herodotus and others, we get to read a little bit about that and know a little bit about that. It makes perfect sense that the harem for Ahasuerus, for Xerxes, was so numerous. Uh, It may not make sense to us, but in that culture, we know from Herodotus that these, uh, these kings would come back and they would spend considerable amount of time with their harem, you know, let, let's just be honest, when, when we have a bad day, guys, don't we want to come home to our wives and they say, oh, well, you're just the superhero of the world. You're just the best thing that's ever happened. You know, yeah, we, we like the attention, okay? So Xerxes was the same. And uh, so he, he's going through this process to find, well, which of these young, young, lovely ladies am I going to put as queen? Well, he chooses Esther. Why does he choose Esther? Uh, I've asked that question in a lot of youth classes before. I like studying Esther in youth classes. I think it tells us an awful lot about how to live godly in tough situations. And I asked my my kids the question, you know, uh, why did Ahasuerus or Xerxes or whatever you want to call him, why did he choose Esther? And uh, nine times out of ten they say, well, because she was pretty. Well, all of them were pretty. And it's because she found favor with the king. She, She displayed some kind of characteristic that made her stand out from the others. I don't know what that was. I do think that uh, chapter 2 and chapter 3 lead us to believe that Esther is a submissive person. That does not mean weak. Submission does not mean weak. And I think we need to teach our young ladies that as we train them to one day be wives. Uh, submitting to your husband never means being weak. Okay. Esther certainly is not weak. We're going to see that today. So when you come to 3, verse 7 and 8, there's this, uh, there's this murder plot that's being discovered by Mordecai, and the, the king becomes informed about it. The ones who instigated that are, uh, are executed. And now you come to chapter 3, and we're introduced to Haman. Haman has a pride problem, bless his heart. Uh, I try, and, and I try tell y'all to do this and then here I am having the the problem doing it I try to read these narratives remembering that these are real people but Haman my goodness he is a snot nosed little brat he just thinks that everything is owed to him just because of who he is he needs a good butt whipping now Haman has a pride problem and he is so upset 
that one measly little Jew doesn't bow down to him, that he decides, well, we just need to get rid of everybody. And that's where we are now. Uh, when you come to verse 7 and 8, what Haman is doing is he is casting lots, casting pur here. Uh, pur is lots. And he's trying to figure out what's the best time for me to go in to the king to ask this request. When is the best time going to be? Now you have to remember that the Persians were Zoroastrians religiously. The wise men who come to Jesus at his birth, those are, or near his birth I should say, he could be two years old at that point. They are Zoroastrians. Okay, they're not Jews. They are wise men from the east. Right? So, why cast lots when Zoroastrianism is ruled by the stars? I think there's good evidence to suggest that Haman was uh, not really a follower of Zoroastrianism, that he was more into, uh, you know, soothsaying and the magic and things like that, that the other nations had fallen under. But regardless, that's what he did. They cast lights, they found a date to come, and that leads us then to chapter 3 and verse 9. So he says, If it pleases the king, let, the, let it be decreed that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business, that they, may put into, that they may put it into the king's treasuries. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadetha, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, The money is given to you, the people also, to do, with as, to do with them as it seems good to you. Now remember, let's go back one, uh, one slide here. In verse 8, he says, Their laws are different from those of every other people. They do not keep the king's laws. He never once talks about the Jews. He says there's a certain people. And here's what they're doing. Their laws are different. They don't keep the king's laws. Now, that's not true. But we don't know who he's talking about here. At least the king doesn't know. We know because of context. The king doesn't know. So then he says, if it pleases the king, I will pay 10,000 talents of silver. Now, you go and read a commentary, which by the way, in my opinion, there is no good commentary on Esther. But you go read a commentary and figure out how much 10,000 talents is, you'll get a vast array of numbers. So let me tell you how much 10,000 talents is. I don't know. I don't have a clue. But I do know that it is two-thirds of the annual budget for the entire nation of Persia. Okay, get this. Two-thirds of the annual budget. Uh, does anyone have any idea what the annual budget of America is? Because I do not. Does anyone know? Well, let's just say, for those of you who are going to Google it for me, take two-thirds of that, that's what Haman offered to pay. That is a lot of money. So let's ask the question, how in the world is Haman going to get that money? Well, when you come down a little bit further, and we'll talk about this uh, a little bit later, they're going to plunder the Jews. Not only are they going to kill them, they're going to plunder them. I think there's good evidence to suggest that the plan is to take what the Jews have to plunder them. That's going to pay for this uh, excursion. Maybe Haman was just that rich. I highly doubt it, but maybe he was. Um, the, the fact is, we just don't know. But this is an incredible amount of money. Now, remember when the marriage of Esther and Ahasuerus happened, that two, two things happened nationally. No taxes, no military draft. Ahasuerus had just lost a war. And then he comes back and says, no, you know, we're not going to have any taxes, we're not going to have a draft. As king, that's the last thing that I think I would do after losing a war. I would want to resupply my military and get funds for protection. This answers the question to everything. How are you going to function as king when you've squandered everything on this failed military uh, excursion? Well... 10,000 talents, that's a lot of money. Okay, so 
uh, the king, verse 10, took his signet ring from his hand, gave it to Haman. The signet ring is a sign of authority, right? You give your signet ring to someone, that means they have your authority. They have your blessing to do whatever. Basically, if you do something under or while wearing that signet ring, let's say, you have the power of the king. Uh, and notice here in verse 10, he's called the enemy of the Jews. Well, we have not been told by the mouth of Haman that he wants to get rid of the Jews. Context tells us that. But here he's already being referred to as the enemy of the Jews. Verse 11, the king said to Haman, the money is given you, the people uh, also to do with them as it seems good to you. So the king basically says, look, you're my right-hand man. You probably know better than I do. What you want to do, just go ahead and do. So verse 12 then the king's scribes were summoned on the 13th day of the first month. And an edict, according to all that Haman commanded, was written to the king's satraps and the governors over the provinces and to, uh, and to the officials of all the peoples. And every province in its own script, every people in its own language, it was written in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed with the king's signet ring. Letters were sent by couriers and all the king's provinces with uh, to all the king's provinces excuse me with instructions to destroy kill and annihilate all Jews young and old women and children in one day the 13th day of the 12th month which which is the month of Adar to plunder their goods okay so there we have the plundering how are you going to pay for this Haman i think that there's a strong case to be made that the plundering of the Jews that's going to be how he pays these tithes and talents now he summons the scribes, they write these things. Not only do they write them, they write them in every language. Okay, that's interesting because you would think that being conquered, that you have to assimilate your language. We know that when Alexander the Great conquered the known world at the time, that he forced all of his conquered lands to learn Greek. That's why our New Testament was originally written in Greek, though Rome had taken over. Most people in that day spoke Greek because of what Alexander the Great did with his uh, Hellenization of the known world. So it's, it's very important here to note that everyone knows exactly what's happening, right? Uh, we say sometimes, especially in Bible study, well, it got lost in translation. This ain't going to get lost in translation if you write it in every language. Hey, this is a big deal. Everybody's going to know exactly what's going to happen. Notice here where it says uh, that he, he, it was written to the king's satraps, to the governors, and to the officials. Herodotus tells us that there are three levels of governing authorities in Persia. Uh, the satraps were, were over large areas. At, at most, there were 30. Okay, so you think about the nation of Persia, how big Persia and media was, and to only have 30 of these people, you can see just how much land and how many uh, subjects they had under them. The governors were the next level down, and then you have the officials. Your Bible may call them the princes. Uh, they're over the, your local authorities. You know, it's like, it's like having your city officials, if you will. So you're, they're going through all the levels of uh, politics, every language, and they're going to kill, I'm sorry, they're going to destroy, kill, and annihilate all Jews. Now in English, when we read that, we may say, well, that's redundant. It means the same thing over and over and over again. When you read it in Hebrew, it's different words, which is why we translate it the ways that we do. But the emphasis is on the power behind the killing, right? It, it's not just we're going to kill, we're going to annihilate, we're going to destroy. There's going to be no trace of them that they ever existed. Everyone who is a Jew is going to die. That's important because when we come to chapter 4, well really the end of chapter 3 and the beginning of chapter 4, Esther seems to think that she's exempt from this. And Mordecai is going to tell her, no, you're not. No one knows that you're a Jew right now, but you're not exempt from this. Okay. So let's go to verse 14 then. A copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province by proclamation to all peoples to be ready for that day. Boy, wouldn't that be awful to have some 
document show up at your doorstep and say, oh, by the way, on this day, you're going to die. I, I just can't imagine. The couriers went out um, hurriedly by order of the king. The decree was issued in Susa, the citadel. The king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. Now, there's, in all honesty, there's not too much to say about these two verses. But I do want to touch just briefly on verse 15. What happens in verse 15? Mass chaos and utter peace. Right? This is a literary style used by the author, whomever the author may be, to show the vast contrast between the ones who instigated the plan and the ones who were going to be part of the plan. The king and Haman, they, you know, Haman got what he wanted. The king didn't care. But the entire city of Susa is turned upside down. Now we have to remember, Susa is the capital of Persia. The king lives in Susa. He can look out his window and see the turmoil. But what does he do? He sits down to drink. To drink with Haman. I think one thing we've seen about the king so far is, old boy likes his alcohol, and he makes bad decisions under the influence. All right, so that's the end of uh, chapter. Let's get into chapter four here. When Mordecai listened, uh, excuse me, when Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, went out in the midst of the city, and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate uh, closed, in, closed in sackcloth. And in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. This seems bizarre for us because we don't mourn that way, right? You know, when, when a national tragedy happens or, or maybe we even lose a loved one or something like that, uh, we, we might shed a tear or we go to the funeral home and all that stuff. And, and I, I understand that I have to walk on eggshells when I say this, but really we live in a society that tries to hide those emotions. I mean, even when you're at the funeral home, you have to sit there and smile and shake hands with everybody. Uh, and, and I've been to funerals, you have too, where uh, there are those people who are so emotionally distraught from what's happened that they just, you know, fall on the floor and they're rolling around and they're crying. And it's, it, what's the first thing that we do as the audience in that? I mean, we judge them, don't we? Like, oh, get it together, you know? Well, Oriental mourning is so much different than what we're used to, especially with national tragedy. You know, I remember, uh, and I'm sure we all do, when 9-11 happened, you know, everyone was just in awe of what was going on. And the next day at school, all we did was have a moment of silence. And, and that was it. You know, you're supposed to suppress that and just move on with what's going on in your day. Well, here, Mordecai, he is just absolutely distraught. He tears his clothes. He puts on these, these rags and, and he, he lays in ashes, which is you know, what they did to show their signs of mourning. He's crying out with a loud and bitter cry, uh, very emotional here, kind of over the top in our eyes, but certainly not to them. Notice where he goes. He goes to the king's gate. Every time Mordecai is mentioned, he's in connection with the king's gate. I don't know if he was going to work. I don't know if he was trying to get to Esther. I don't know if he was just going to see what was going on in the world, but he couldn't get in, right, because you cannot come in to the king's gate dressed in sackcloth. Makes perfect sense. Notice here it says, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and lamenting. Fasting is mentioned twice in the book of Esther, never associated with prayer. I think prayer is involved and can be assumed later in chapter 4 here, I don't think prayer is, uh, is part of this. And the reason why is because this is not a fast that's trying to gain attention in favor of God. This is a fast of mourning. 
You, you know, you, you've probably been that way before where you are so emotionally distraught, something bad's happened, maybe you're facing a, a difficulty at work or with family or something like that, and you just can't eat, right? It, it'll make you sick if you, if you eat or even if you think about food. I think that's what's going on here. There's a, a huge emotional outbreak among the Jews, and I, of course, rightly so. When you come to verse 4, uh, the Bible says, When Esther's young women and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. So what did they tell her? They were telling her about Mordecai. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called for Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai and learn what what this was and why it was. And Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. It may not seem like a lot here, but I think there is. Uh, Esther gets wind that Mordecai is mourning and, and so she sends clothes down to him so that they can come in contact with each other. He cannot come into the king's gate if he's dressed in sackcloth. She cannot go to him. But if he would put this on, if he would change, you know, and, and get out of this mourning phase, they could communicate. Well, Mordecai refuses. Now the question is, why does Mordecai refuse? Why won't he just put on the clothes? I mean, for crying out loud, you've been out here mourning and fasting and lamenting. It, it, maybe it's time to change your clothes. Well, Josephus has an interesting opinion on this. Josephus says that the time for Mordecai's mourning had not yet come to pass. And so he, was, he wasn't going to do something that you know he didn't have to do because in the Oriental culture and Jewish culture, there's a certain time for mourning and stuff like that. You don't find that in the text. I think there's good probability that that may be the case. You just don't find that in the text. But really, we don't know why he refused. Uh, maybe he wanted to make more of a public scene about it. I just don't know. Uh, verse 5, Esther called for Hathak, one of the king's eunuch. Now, we've talked about eunuch before, and we go back and forth in Esther with, is this a castrated male or is this a nobleman? The word can mean either. And I've submitted to you that if it's dealing with other men or a guard of some kind, it's just a nobleman. If it's dealing with women or in charge of a harem, it's a castrated male. And I think that would make sense here. I think this is uh, a castrated male who's been put in charge of attending to the queen, to Esther. Now notice uh, where it says in verse 6 that he went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. He's there at the king's gate. He's at the square, but he's not in the king's gate. He's still associated with it. Uh, Mordecai told all that happened to him. Now, one reason why I think the book of Esther was written by Mordecai is because it makes an editorial note here to say, and I told them the exact sum of money. Having told the exact sum of money demands an eyewitness account. Okay? You can believe what you want. My opinion. So verse 8, uh, Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king, beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. And Hathak went uh, and told Esther what Mordecai had said. But Mordecai is basically saying we've got to do something, which is what I love about Mordecai. He is a man of action. It doesn't seem like it. He seems like the wise old sage who sits at the gate and who just kind of interjects here and there. But he is always a man of action. He didn't hesitate whenever the plan to kill the king came up. He acted on that. He's not hesitating now when the threat of his people is there. And, and, and I wonder if it's because he knows that he is the reason why. <laughs> you know, it's because Mordecai wouldn't bow, right? Now, I don't know that for certain. But he's, he's going to do something. He tries to get in communication with, uh, with Esther to tell her that she has to do something. Now, before we move on to perhaps the most famous part of the book of Esther, we need to realize where Esther is at this moment in her life. She has been married to the king for a considerable amount of time. We're going to find out in a few verses that she has fallen out of favor with the king for about 30 days for a month that she has had no contact with him for those 30 days. She cannot go to him unless he calls for her. 
Now, we get that. Context tells us that, and we're, we're good with that because we know that part of the story. We need to realize how much Persian culture has influenced Esther to this moment. Esther's name is not Esther. Anybody remember what her Hebrew name is? Hadassah, thank you. They have taken her name and given her a new one. And by the way, we're not entirely sure what Esther means. Our closest guess means uh, it's related to a star. Now, that makes perfect sense for Zoroastrian culture. So think about you know, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel, and, and the names that were given to them. They had everything taken from them. Her identity as a Jew has been stripped from her. And now she is queen of Persia. But even then... She's still not where she needs to be to act. So we come to verse 10. Then Esther spoke to Hathak and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come in to the king these 30 days. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Now, there's a number of ways of reading this passage, and it all depends on your presupposition as to how we look at Esther. A presupposition number one says that Esther is just this, she's this beautiful, you know, gentle, meek young lady who is really trying, but she says, you know, I, I, just, I just can't, and, and here's why, this is the law, I want to be a, a law-abiding citizen, and, and I just can't. And then there's another way of reading, and I'll just be honest with you, this is the way I read it. You know, when you're, when you're a kid, and you smart off to your mom or dad, this sounds like a smart off comment to me because she says all the king's servants know now if you agree with me and believe that Mordecai is a employee if you will of the king at the king's gate that he has some type of role there not that's just not his hangout spot that's he has a role there he is a, a servant of the king and she says all the king's servants know that no one can come into him. And Herodotus actually backs this up, by the way. Herodotus says that there are only a few people who could go into the king without having been called, and it's the seven families that are mentioned. In if you're part of one of those seven families, you can go in. If you're not, you have to be called. Well, guess what? Here Esther is. She's the wife of the king, and she has to be called because she's not one of the seven families. I, I see here Esther... I can't get help from somewhere else get somebody else to do your work, your dirty work so verse 13 and 14 of course this is uh, the most famous passage in Esther it's probably the one that many of the only passage that many of us have ever heard from Esther before and uh, it's our theme verse by the way for the book then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise from the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Now again, we read this, and we read it one of two ways. We read it way number one as saying, Oh Esther, God has a plan for you. How do you know that God didn't bring you for such a time as this? Friends, I'm here to tell you that's not the way I read it. Because I've been in arguments with parents before. And I know that if you raise your voice to a parent, if you're lucky enough not to have your mouth slapped off, they're going to raise their voice back. And I can imagine Mordecai saying, Esther, listen. The whole reason God brought you to this moment is for this moment now. Of course, Mordecai and Esther have a way of communicating with each other. It's very special, very uh, familial, and you see that here. I want you to notice uh, two things before we close. Number one, I want you to notice the thing of uh, the, the faith of Mordecai. 
Mordecai says, if you do nothing, deliverance for the Jews will come somewhere else. If you don't do anything, uh, in verse uh, 14, if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. That's faith. It takes a great deal of faith to look in the, in the face of death and say, I'm going to be okay. That, that's almost exactly what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said to Nebuchadnezzar. Throw us in the fire. If we die, we die. But we have faith that God's going to see us through. Mordecai here, I think, displays a great deal of faith. And number two, I want you to notice verse 14, this last question. Who knows whether, whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this? We don't have time tonight to get into a deep discussion of this. The question often arises, how much control does God have over our lives? Does God predestine us to certain things? Does God control us like robots? I would like to shift our attention away from Esther for just a moment to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. You don't have to turn there. We're just going to talk about it a little bit. You can take a note of it if you want. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. You know the poem like I do. You know, there's a time for everything, a time to be born, time to die, a time to plant, and a time to reap, and, and all that stuff. So you, you know the poem, but we usually stop at the end of the poem, but that's not the end of the passage. The, the end of the passage goes on to talk about how God is over and in control of those particular times. The only way you were born is because God allowed it. And the only way you're going to die is if God, God allows it. Now we can talk about suicide and all that stuff, but that ain't what we're talking about. So how much of our life does God have control over? My belief is that God has given all of us certain talents, certain things that make us unique so that we can serve in a unique way in the kingdom of God. And that God brings us to certain times, but God doesn't make us do anything within those times. That's up to us. Esther could have said no, she didn't. And we can say no or we can say yes to opportunities that come our way. The wisdom of Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verses 1 through 15 is for us to look at those times and to say, this is a moment that, has, that God has ordained. All right, Esther's going to say that to, to this particular uh, moment and we'll get into what she does next week as we look at uh, verse 15 through 17 to end up the chapter and to move on into chapter 5.